curiosity is the cure for boredom. There is no cure for curiosity. And if you and I read the same book, the things we would pull out of it would be different. Like Jonathan Lethem, the, the novelist said that if you think something is original, you just don't know the sources. All of my output is a function of what I'm reading and experiencing. We're a vessel for the experiences and ideas we come across. Who do you admire and can you do your version of that? The artists that really resonate are when they pull taste and audience taste together in the center of a Venn diagram. And the challenge is finding the overlap between those things. Everyone that's put out work into the world has had the experience of thinking, this is the, the greatest thing I've ever made, and no one likes it. Conversely, you put something out that you think, I think this is good, but it probably won't do great uh, when I publish it. And that thing goes crazy viral. Searching for certainty is just like a fool's error because there, there is no such thing. Well, hello everyone, it's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another episode of Infinite Loops. I have been looking forward to having Billy Oppenheimer on my show since I discovered his amazing stuff. And he was gracious enough to agree to come on and chat with me. He is the research assistant to Ryan Holiday. We'll get into that after a little bit. I love the fact that you cold emailed him in, in 2018 and, and offered to work for free. I love your style. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Jim. I'm a fan of, of the podcast. So it was surreal when you um, reached out to, to come on. Oh, well, I'm happy to hear been that. been a, a long-time listener. This is, <laughs> this is really cool. Very, very cool. Uh, it's great when people like us discover each other, I think. So, like, you you went to work for Ryan, who I find very fascinating. I read his first book, Trust Me, I'm Lying, and, yep. like, before he got into the whole stoic thing and everything. I loved his first book, honestly, because I thought it was such a great expose. I used to do a lot of traditional media. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I, it just rang so true w w w with me with like how like people get these uh, things put in, in into the traditional media. But you ended up working for him. So you help with his research. You helped write, edit the five more recent books. You grew his email list to 500,000. Okay. So listen up, uh, fans. Uh, you going to teach us how to do that or is it a secret? Um, well, I, I wouldn't say I grew it. I was, I, I joined this team when the list was at 50,000 or so. Um, and it was, it definitely was having some momentum. And I think the one, the, the main thing I've learned from Ryan is, and I've written about it a little bit, um, on Twitter and, and elsewhere, but he doesn't have. He doesn't even know the login to the software we use to send out the email. Like he, he doesn't know what the list is currently at. He's, he's solely focused on the content side of things. Um, and that's been a big lesson for me is just to focus on putting out good stuff. And I think the numbers follow. And, and the other thing is Ryan is he's, he's not in a rush to grow that, that list. He's, I think his exit strategy is is death with the daily stoic stuff. Um, so it was just it was just a matter of time before you hit big numbers like 500k, and, and I'm sure it'll, it'll continue to grow from there. So uh, we we are spiritual brothers then, because I do not know <laughs> log in to any uh, part of our confusion to people who are joining us. So. I'm sitting here waiting on Zoom. I don't set up any of these, right? So I'm like psyched to be talking to Billy and I'm noticing the time is kind of like ticking by and I'm like, huh, I wonder what's going on. So I check my email, no email. So I, I'm like, maybe he messaged me on Twitter and you did in fact message me yes. on Twitter and my side fell down and did not send you the appropriate link. So I apologize for that. Uh, but like Ryan, I have no idea what the logins are for any of our stuff at OSB. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I learned on Twitter 
when we got a million downloads for the podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, I learned at the same time right. that, that everyone else did because I have this thing, which is I, I'm naturally a fairly competitive person. And mm -hmm. I, what I didn't want to happen was I didn't want, I knew because like human OS, we all run human OS, right? I knew that if like a show that I really loved, like for Brian Morescu, who had a who yes. wrote a fabulous book, and yep. I loved that podcast, and I and I thought like this is probably going to do not really great numbers, but I didn't look intentionally, and yeah. I and I never look. I have no idea what our most popular podcast is. None. Mm. And the reason I don't is because I know that even subconsciously it would bias me right and and so tell ryan I, i'm the same as him i have no idea and thank god i have guys like you because i would be yeah. a shit show w without it <laughs> yes well i find that this is kind of a common trait of people who actually do the the work i'm most i most admire and uh, inspired by is just the sole focus on doing the thing um and then the accidental byproduct of that is that, that they actually have the, the largest audiences also. Yeah. I, I, in, in, in my uh, case, I'm not looking for the largest audience. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I'm intentionally like doing everything wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because yeah. like, I want people who are, you know, it's just selfish of me, but I, I want to hook up. I want to meet people like you. I, I want to meet people who are interested in the same things that I'm interested in. And right. that's very selfish. <laughs> I'll admit it. Um, yeah. That's how I find really cool topics and really cool uh, people like yourself to talk to. I want to talk about your stuff, the six and six. I, I like yes. the way that you, uh, first off, you weave things that are people are interested in together, right? Like sports, uh, literature, politics, music, stories, and then you get a couple of great anecdotes and you get a couple of great quotes. And I think personally, it's a great way to tell a story mm -hmm. because like, you know, Stalin didn't say it, but it's such a great quote. We're going to continue to attribute it to him. Uh, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million are a statistic, right? Mm. And he really, or whoever came up with that copywriting and attributed it to Stalin. That's a good check, yeah. by the way. Um, uh, I love, uh, Banksy and he, and he said, any, any shit sounds smarter if you put the name of a dead philosopher after it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. But, but so, so what was this just a natural, the six at six, the, the, the storytelling style, um, the, the way you, 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 you do it. Did that evolve? Is it just something that you naturally fell into? Talk to me about that. It's evolved. Um, so initially when. I was starting the newsletter. Um, I had a conversation with Ryan was encouraging me to start putting my own work out there for a while. I was just writing kind of behind the scenes stuff with him and he was starting to encourage me to put my own work out there. And I knew would, I was going to start a newsletter. Um, and I, I didn't know one of the hangups for me was that I, I thought I needed to have like my niche or my, my niche, um, in the way that Ryan has stoicism and James Clear's habits. And a lot of the people I, I read have kind of their, their niche carved out. And I was for a while trying to figure out what that was going to be. And I talked to Ryan about that and he was like, you just have to start. You're trying, he was like, you're trying to map out the whole nine innings, just throw the first pitch. And so I just, I, I started to think about what are some things I currently do that would lend itself to newsletter content. And I have adapted his note card system that he uses to research his books. Um, so I was, I was thinking my first idea was to just scan a couple of note cards each week that I had made that week and send them out. And I played lacrosse in college and I wore number six. So I was, I was going to call it six something. Um, and it was just going to be six note cards each week. And then I scanned a few note cards. And I just didn't like the way it looked. Um, so I, and then I thought, okay, I'll just transcribe these. So, the, so the, the first, 
10 or 12 editions of the 6 out 6 newsletter were just six things I was transcribing straight from note cards. Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, I, I kind of evolved it into where I pick a theme each week and all six of um, of those notes are around one theme, but it's still, I'm, I'm basically still transcribing straight from a note card. Um, but I try to have each note card be, uh, um, uh, like a standalone. So someone other than me should be able to pick it up and, and get what the point is of it. So it's not just like a quote, it'll be the way it might look in a, in an article. So there's like a, a lead into the anecdote. Um, so it's evolved. It, it started out as just six completely s different, unrelated ideas that I'd come across. Um, and now I, I like the picking a theme and having everything revolve around that one topic. Which is, is very cool because it is very specific to kind of uh, the evolutionary mimetic way humans learn, right? Mm. And, and uh, another thing you say often, and I like this idea, and I, I think it was originally Andrew Huberman's, the introjection where you absorb the qualities of somebody that you're interested in. Yes. I like that idea. And, and, and I also like the idea when you don't know what to do, you say, what would, you know, in my case, Feynman do or Voltaire yeah. do or, or something like that. Right. How, was that uh, just from, from your reading uh, from, from Ryan, where did you light up on that? Uh, Ryan, Ryan and Robert Green are two of my, like, those are the two people I think of, like, how would Ryan or Robert write this? I'm also a huge fan of Morgan Housel, who I know, I know you, you've had on the podcast. Yeah. Um, I, I love his writing style. He's a big influence on me. Um, I, and he probably is where I, along with Ryan and Robert, is the biggest influence on me in the way that he, I like the way he'll use a story about Ice Ages, for instance, and tie it back to compound, like the phenomenon of compounding. Um, the way he takes like two seemingly disparate ideas and, t and weaves them together in a, in a story, um, was something I was consciously thinking about when I was starting the newsletter. Um, and he still is, is one of my favorite people to, to read. Morgan's really interesting. I tried to hire Morgan and he, he had my number way before uh i he was quick on the uptake and said no i won't work for you <laughs> Be, because this is way before morgan had done much of anything and i'm yeah. i met him uh and was super impressed by uh you know his style i love yeah. I, I i love the way he he does things too he really understands the power of storytelling mm -hmm. and um uh, like he's definitely somebody i could learn much from uh, because I love, as you point out, right. He, he marries very different things together yep. and that creates this beautiful little, ah, oh yeah. You know, this aha moment. Right. And yes. And, and, and so it's, it's also kind of like, uh, observational learning. Uh, Andrew, uh, Banduro has a, what he calls social learning theory. Um, and, you know, the, you mentioned that, um, you often, when you were looking for another research assistant, uh, to work with you, you'd give them a biography and say, give me two anecdotes and two quotes yep. and, and, and they couldn't do it. Talk to me about that. I find that really interesting. Yeah. Um, there's just, I, I think one of the things Ryan is really good at is, the gems he pulls out of, of books that he reads. And it's, it seems like it would be an easy task, but it's interesting. We've had tons of people try this kind of trial, um, task to, to potentially do some research with us and the things they come back with just are not interesting or 
they don't have that eye for what will be interesting to others. And so like Morgan, when he's reading and he comes across a story that he pulls out of a book that hundreds, maybe even thousands of other people have read, but when they, when they read, they didn't see what Morgan saw in it. There's like an eye for what will be interesting to others. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know how it, you develop it. I, I think just through repetition, I've talked to some other people about like this idea of taste and can it be developed or is it kind of, um, something you have or don't have. And I'm not exactly sure what the answer is to that. I, I, I think that, uh, it's both really it, it yeah. is some, I, I think you need to be incredibly curious, which you clearly are. And, and, you know, Breen Brown says curiosity is a shit starter. And I love that quote because yeah. I also love the Dorothy Parker, um, you know, curiosity is the cure for boredom. There is no cure for curiosity. And, and like, I, I am just like, I, I can't, I just can't stop being interested in stuff. And so that how, what happens is you dive down the rabbit holes and I'm, I'm just looking at my notes that I was doing, working off your stuff and, uh, John Meyer's definition of a writer's block is that the, there's two people inside your head, uh, yes. the writer and the reader. I love that. And that was, yes. awesome. I'd seen that. Uh, I don't know whether you read David Shields reality hunger, um, no. but you might enjoy it because he's an essayist and he's like really hardcore. Uh, basically one of his great pull quotes from it that, you know, I just always have in my mind is he's going on this diatribe about how digital media is going to destroy the old copyright network because digital, it's not a fair fight, right? Digital wants to be free. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he, and he puts it so beautifully. I put it up on Twitter a couple of times, but his tagline I love is reality can't be copyrighted. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I think that that's really, really true. And one of the things that, it made me think of that I wanted to discuss with you is this idea of uh, Jung, Carl Jung, the uh, the uh, student of Freud and ultimately the rival of Freud, mm -hmm. had this great quote, which is, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. Yes. So you, do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Um Another person I'm, I'm really inspired by is, is Rick Rubin, and he talks about um, nothing begins with us. Like everything is kind of, we're, we're a vessel for the experiences and ideas we come across. And I'm, I'm a big believer, like everything that I, all of my output is a function of what I'm reading and experiencing and um so I definitely, I definitely agree with that. So like Nikola Tesla, he, he, he believed that our brains were essentially receivers and broadcasters mm. and, and that literally you pulled your best ideas out of what he would call the ether. Um, and Rupert Sheldrake is a morphic field guy with same kind of idea. Um, and, and I wonder like, Back to taste for a minute, right? Um, like, there's an artist, I can't remember who said it, but it was along the lines of, like, th there's three different kinds of artists, right? Th those who innately see beauty and then have the ability to have others see beauty as well. Mm. And and then the second type of artist was uh, he this person said even more impactful and he referenced van gogh and and he said these artists are time travelers they see what others will see but they see it like 50 years before everyone else can see right. it mm -hmm. and and then he said in the the rarest cat i can't remember who's wrote this i i read a lot and i remember what i read but i don't always know who wrote who wrote it yeah um, 
but the the third one that I thought was fascinating was he goes the third category of artists that really I am obsessed by are the ones who are seeing things that I I simply as far into the future as I try to look I can't see. So mm. like I I wonder about practice you know practice your scales you 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 had a, a thing about kobe bryant spraining his uh ankle in the in the uh championship and i loved i loved his solution to it like oh okay so what is something i can do that would make my ankle stronger than anything else and he discovers tap dancing yes do you follow a similar like when you're coming up with all your ideas for your newsletter and and pitching stuff to run is is that how you go about it? Do you just is it like this is what I'm trying to solve, and then you go broad? How do you, how do you do it? Talk to me a bit about your process. Yeah, I think of I think about that uh, the scales thing a lot, and I I've recently realized that the the note cards are like that's Tyler Callen's question, right? Is like what do you do that is like a a pianist practicing scales? And I think for me, it's it's making note cards. Um, and one of the things I've, I think has helped the, my taste develop is getting to send things to Ryan and have him either say, this is good or this is bad or drafting an article and sending it to him. And he rejects it and says, these are the things you need to fix about it. And then I iterate on those notes. Um, so I, I, and over time, like now when I send him a draft, it's closer to where it needs to be on the first, the first pass than it was two years ago. Um, but the, the note cards are big because, uh, and I, especially doing it by hand, I think, because there's times where I'm going back through a book and if I can't convince myself to go through, to put the energy or the effort into transcribing something from a book I'm reading onto a note card, um, it's probably a good sign that that thing is not worth capturing. Uh, like Mitch Hedberg had this joke about how he would keep his pen on the other side of the room because if he had an idea for a joke, if he couldn't convince himself to get up and go get his pen, he was he would convince himself that the joke wasn't good enough. I love and. That. People often email me because I have this article about my note, the note card system, and they'll be like, you know, you can set up Kindle to have it go directly into Notion. And I, that's, that's like the exact opposite of what I want to do. Um, cause that, when you read a book on the first go, like everything I, I underlined and highlighted a bunch of stuff, and then you go back through and you realize that a lot of those highlights don't hold up as, as interesting. And through the practice of identifying which ones are worth transcribing onto a note card, over time, your ability to to pinpoint those things gets better and better. Um, so I do think it's like the a, a really solid form of practice. I agree. Uh, and obviously, I have some motivated reasoning as I've kept more than 40 years of handwritten journals. And, oh, wow. Uh, I'm going to uh, have them all digitized so that the AI can explain me to me. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, this is speculative because I haven't found anything like that can really confirm that this is correct. I think that there's something different. Uh, it occupies it different. And for those of us who are listening, I'm holding up a pen here. If you're watching, you'll see me holding it up. Um, but I think that it goes to a different part of our brain when we actually write it out with our own hand. Mm -hmm. And the unfortunate thing is I, I want to kind of find like a scientific reason for it. And most of the reasons for it are pretty woo-woo. And not yeah. that I'm opposed to woo-woo. I think that some woo-woo actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But um, like I am convinced that it, it you are physically getting a thought out of your head and putting it into the real world or yes. what we perceive as the real world. 
Yeah. And, and, and so I do persist in writing notes rather than doing like all of the, uh, I, most of the folks who are teammates of mine are like your age. And, yeah. and, and they're all like, will you please just put it all in notion? And like, you, yeah. you are this chaotic attractor and we want you to capture it all here. And I'm like, but that's how like all this works for me. Right. right. And, yeah. and I love that forcing function of keeping the pen on the other side of the room. That's yeah. great. I'm going to, I'm going to steal that for sure. Yeah. And because I, like you, I do read on Kindle or Kindle for iPad. Right. And, and it's so funny that you say that because what I do is I export the notes, the highlights, right. And the mm -hmm. notes that I have piped into the iPad, but then the, that's my raw material. Right. Then I go through, then I go through that and I'm like, I have no idea why I highlighted this. That kind yes. of is dumb, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then, and then, I write the ones that I think are worthwhile. That hold up. Yes. Right. And and so it's like that iterative process and it just it it le leads you to a better outcome, I think. At least it does for me. But like one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is I I I'm mostly just because of what I'm doing now, I'm mostly reading nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I also love fiction. I'm a huge fan of fiction. And, you know, do, do you do you try for a balance between fiction and nonfiction when you're, you know, doing your your newsletter? What about cultural blind spots? Like, I know I've got tons of blind spots, right? We all. Yeah. Do. Um, how do you. First off, let's deal with the fiction versus nonfiction. And and then how do you have a solution for cultural blind spots? I read mostly nonfiction. Um, I my favorite genre is biography. I, I just love reading um, about artists and people throughout history. That um, like right now I'm I'm going through. I recently read this this biography of Dr. Seuss, and it was the biographer that wrote it has written five or six others. So I ordered those, and I'm just going through through his his work. And that tends to be what happens for me is I get um, I find a writer who I really like, and I just order all of their like that's that's what got me. Uh, that's what happened with Ryan, for instance, is somebody recommended one of his books, and I enjoyed it so much that. I, ordered all of his others and I, I still have that habit of just finding someone and, and going down the rabbit hole of their work um and it tends to be nonfiction writers i think because that's the style of of writing i'm doing um i'm attracted to that that genre um i definitely do have a blind spot for for fiction um and I don't know what this the solution is. I, I sort of just am trying to follow what interests me. Like I, I quit a lot of books if if they're they haven't hooked me in by chapter three or four, I'm I move on because um I'm just trying to find the things that, that really hook me in. Um but yeah, I don't have a good solution to the, the blind spot question. Yeah, I mean what one of the things uh, I'm a uh, I, I probably uh you left to my own devices would probably read more fiction than nonfiction. Uh, hmm. Just because I like, I do the same thing as you do, by the way, when I find a writer like Robert Anton Wilson, I always quote him. Yeah. I found one of his books and then I had to read all of them. Yeah. I thought like he was such a cool guy. Same with Bucky Fuller. Bucky Fuller is much harder to read though, to be honest. Yeah. And it's like, um, you know, the hero's journey he is so much easier to listen to his interview with, uh, I'm talking about Joseph Campbell. Mm. Um, he, oh yeah. He, the power of myth. He, yeah. But yeah, the power of myth, but the, the interviews that he did with Bill Moyers for PBS yeah. are much easier and get the, it across much better yes. than his own books. But like, um, 
like in fiction, uh, David Mitchell is probably my my most favorite uh, literary fiction author. He wrote Cloud Atlas, and um, he's just a, he's like a really great writer. Um, and and so what I find some of the times helpful is I see connections between nonfiction and biographies. You must love David Senra's uh, Founders Podcast. Love it. Yeah, David's a great guy. He's he so is. insane in his emotion. <laughs> for for a while, I I listened to that podcast and I thought he had somebody else in the room with him because he often will do something where he'll say like, "You and I have been talking about this for weeks," and I thought he was talking to like a co-host or something. And then only recently I realized it was just him in there. I was like, "How does this guy have the energy that he has when it's just him in a room recording?" Unbelievable. He's, he's amazing. And he's like that in real life too. Yeah. I had lunch with him when I was down in Miami and like, I, he just crackles with enthusiasm and yeah. you just can't help, but be drawn into it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like when, when he, when you get into a conversation with him, you just lose all sense of time. Yes. And like we had this incredible conversation over lunch and I looked like looked up and it was three and a half hours. Yes. Well, <laughs> He's someone I've talked to a bunch about the taste question because I'll often listen to one of his episodes and then I'll order the book that he does an episode on and I'll read through it. And almost always, David has pulled out all the best parts. He has unbelievable taste and he it's a great like service that he does in that he, he takes these long biographies and does an hour and a half episode and, and gives you the best parts from, from that book. Totally. And like yeah. that, that is, I think, you know, one of my uh, ideas about the new world that we're moving into is that for the first time, all, like ever, you'll be able to be a solopreneur if you have good taste and you are an excellent curator. David is exhibit A of that. Mm -hmm. Like David, that's his, he found his calling. Yes. And and he has outstanding taste. Yes. Like when we were talking about um, certain things, like he would tell me, oh, but did you think about this? And I'm like, no, I didn't. But that is such a great idea. Yeah. So he's like this. He he is able in, in AI. One of the things that you want to be able to do is compress ideas. Yeah. Right. Yep. And and David is like a, 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 a definitely a human large language model that can compress ideas down to their core, but, mm -hmm. but not too much. Right. It's just, yeah. right. And, right. And I definitely think that, yeah, that taste, you can learn through repetition to have better taste. Right. Like when I read stuff that I wrote originally, it basically it sucked. It was horrible. And I, uh, you know, like I have these journals going back to when I was 19. Ugh. Ugh. But, you know, just through repetition, repetition, repetition. That's why propaganda works, right? Yeah. So you just repeat, repeat, repeat. I wonder so, though. Go. Well, I was going to say for you, um, do you, do you think the repetition in, in terms of developing tastes, has it been writing, reading both? Is it, is it re reading great writers? Some of that rubs off on you, you think? Totally. You know, yeah. um, uh, uh, Hunter S. Thompson actually typed out The Great Gatsby. Yes. Because, and, and the reason he did it was he said he wanted to feel, he wanted to know what it felt like to write a masterpiece. I right. thought, I, I, first off, I love that guy. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I, what a, what a cool way to, to do something. I would have never thought about doing that. Mm -hmm. But one thing I did do when I was young is I memorized a hundred poems. Um, because I just thought that that would somehow help me if I yeah. like have in my database, like to his coy mistress, had we but world enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. Right. Wow. And that's yeah. Andrew Marvell. And then that, that brings up Shakespeare's sonnets, which brings up Dean Xanadu did who Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dom decree. So I definitely think there's something to that, but I did that before no knowing about Thompson typing out Gatsby. So I definitely think that the that you can learn to have better taste. I, I definitely think that that's true. 
But I, I wanted to ask another question that kind of links to our friend David. I wonder, is do you think that we could learn, um, like, because everyone we tend to read is survivorship bias, right? And survivorship yeah. bias gets way overused by the cognitive bias crowd. Like, yeah. you know, I, I, I often will say, you know, people – People who say that everything is due to luck, uh, I, the way I transformed that was everything is due to luck, said the most unlucky person in the world. <laughs> hey, yes. Right, right, right. But, but I wonder, like, that isn't something, and, and I just thought about this when I was going over your stuff. Like, do you think there would be value in, like, looking at, like, abject failures? <laughs> right. Probably. I mean... Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. I'm trying to think. There's there is a writer who talks about um, studying bad work as well, and there's a story that uh, John Grisham I think tells when he was first thinking about writing. I forget the first book he wrote, um, but he was a lawyer turned novelist, and he was thinking about making the break from being a lawyer to write to a writer. And he said one of the things that pushed him to go for it was uh, reading bad books. And that gave him the confidence that he could do it too. So I think there's probably something to studying bad work. Um, I don't actively go out looking for it, but I'm, I don't know. I'm not I'm, sure. I'm in the same camp as you. I'm not sure either. And, yeah. but as, as I was getting ready to talk to you, I'm like, huh, I wonder if he's ever kind of thought about that. Right. Uh, because like there's talk about sample size, <laughs> just going to be a huge sample size of shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe. And, um, like I've heard the, the Pixar guys, uh, John Lasseter talked about um, when they were setting out to do their first feature film, they made a list of what they didn't want it to be. Um, all the elements in the movies they they watched at the time that that they didn't like, and they were trying to actively avoid those things. So I think similarly, it could be useful to study people who were failures as, okay, let's not do these things. Um, but I, I, and, and I think that you get some of that when you do read about the, the people who have, um, survived the survivorship bias, like in every biography, you read tons of stories about, you pick up tons of lessons of what, what to try to avoid. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. Douglas Adams said, um, that, um, humans were uniquely qualified to learn from the mistakes of others and yet apparently highly disinclined to do so yeah. <laughs> yeah. which is just so true yeah and 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 i like your your statement about um when you read about these incredible people you're also reading about all the times they fuck things up right yeah definitely like, I I fuck things up all the time, and I th I find that that is where that that is where your maximum opportunity for learning something new comes, right? I think so. Yeah. If, if you're uh, Nabokov had this great line, which was basically curiosity is insubordination in its purest form, and hmm. I I love that because I am by my nature insubordinate and yeah. uh you know ungovernable. And when people, even when I was a kid um, and asked what I wanted to be, I said, unemployable. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> because, you know, I, I just, I, I had that natural kind of inclination. But I also believe very much, I mean, if you look at like the way we managed money was all process. And so I'm a big believer. I, I note that you you talk you mean about you mean like you learned by doing like it was through actually no i oh. I, I learned by studying i learned yeah. by looking at data uh and saying 
I, I learned by saying, I have no fucking idea what the best in way to invest is. I guess I'm just going to go to the videotape, as the old sports guy said, right? Let's go right, to the right. videotape. And, and that's what I did. That's what quants do. We go to the videotape, meaning we're like, okay, let's, let's look at how buying the stocks with the lowest price to earnings ratio did over the last 50 years, right? And, right. and the mistake that people make is they say, well, companies were different back then. It doesn't hold now. And it's like, yeah, companies were completely different. Human nature was exactly the same, right? And, you know, human nature prices securities. So you can look directionally across all the data and you can do really, really well by just following what, what, uh, cool. the, the data suggests, right? Wow. Cool. And so like Annie Duke is a friend of mine and, and I know that you like her, uh, with the process persistence and she has the idea of. She she calls it re resulting. Yes. But really, what a lot of this is 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 process over outcome, right? Like, if if you are an outcome thinker, what Annie calls resulting, you're fucked, kind of, because yeah. you you are essentially only as good as what your last result was. Right. If you are a process. You can you can have a bunch of bad results and just keep going. And yeah. You have this idea that progress is ultimately uh, provides magnitude of consistency. Talk to me about that a little bit. Yes. Um, hmm. Where that? I'm trying to remember where. I think that was my takeaway from reading. something Morgan had written, I'm, I'm forgetting what it was, but I, I remember that article stemmed from something I, I read of Morgan and in the way that he sees something and ties it to finance, I saw that and tied it to the creative process. And um, I think Ryan's a good example of this and, and the note card system as well is, is it, he he's now working on a book where he's using note cards that he made 10 years ago. And the, the function of the process there is that um, he was doing the work without expectation of when this was going to pay off. And it now 10 years later is paying off. Um, but a lot of my favorite um, artists are like that. They're, they're so solely focused on doing the work um, and they have that long-term view and knowing that the over time just stacking those pieces of the process leads to enormous results that, that you can't foresee when you're in the day-to-day -day of it. But um, I, I'm, I'm really trying to remember where, where I read about that from from Morgan Housel, because I wish I could credit him, but um, I forget what well, it was. And, and another thing you say, though, is that um, you, I think you called it um, the repetition, repetition, the magnitude uh, is, and you said panic in your brain is your brain calling you out for not putting in the work. Yeah. And, and I thought that was great because what you what you weave together there was emotions are really predictions from your brain or your mind or whatever you want to call it saying like how much work have you put in yeah if if, if you put in a lot of work you tend to be pretty chill you're easy to vibe with if you haven't put in yep. the work you tend to be like really jumpy and like why, why would you ever ask me that? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you know, I, I, and, and then I think, unfortunately, a lot of people go immediately to bullshit, right? Like, oh, of course I know. Right. Because our brain is, is thinks that it knows everything. And of course it doesn't at all. <laughs> yes. And, and so, you know, the, the, the whole skill versus talent is another thing that you talk a lot about that I'm really interested in because do you, do you need to have a natural talent first to build the skill 
or do you, can you build the skill? Like, I think you can build. So that, that distinction is I, I got from, uh, Dharmesh Shah, the HubSpot founder mm-hmm. and he said that skill is the ability to do something. Talent is the rate at which you acquire the ability to do something. And he was saying that he doesn't feel like he's had a natural ability for anything he's done. He's just put in the work and over time he's acquired that ability. And as I've thought about that, I, I really resonate with that because I never felt like I was naturally good at anything by putting in a lot of work and got good at things. Um, and I, I do think that the, the skill can often be acquired. Um, it's just a matter like how fast you acquire it will vary from person to person. But, um, I do believe that it's kind of universally acquirable. I think so too. Um, I, I don't know where I come out on the, um, on the, how much nascent talent. I mean, like I love class, I love all music. So I love EDM. I, my grandson who's nine is starting, got getting into techno and EDM. And he, when he learned that I loved it, he was like, Haba, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I made him a, a Spotify playlist and, and, uh, the greatest, I think it was one of the nicest things I ever heard said about me. Uh, he said to his other grandfather, uh, Gampy, I love you a lot, but Papa has better music taste. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but, you know, it's like one of the other things that you say that I really, that really resonates with me is care, but don't care too much. Yeah. Like. I think that I just was very lucky that I basically, when I was young, I cared a lot what other people thought about me, but that, that burned off real fast. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And, and and that is like very freeing. Do you, do you, do you care very much what other people think about you? Yeah, I do. I definitely do. I'm trying to get, uh, better at I, I think caring less about it but I am I I when I put something out I, I it feels good that people say that they like it um I'm not like someone that is solely just I put this out and I don't care what people think um I, I like hearing that something I wrote resonated with others or um but I the care but not too much. I think I'm also pretty good at if I put a lot of care into doing something, uh, especially a, with like a written piece of content, and then I put it out and it doesn't do well. I'm um, I'm also okay with that because I I'm I'm gl- I'm happy with the work I put into it, um, and it just for whatever reason it didn't land with with others. That's okay, but um, that's how I often think about the, the care, but not too much idea. Um, but I do, I could probably get better at being less worried of others, what, what others think. I think it's fine if you use it as feedback to get better. Mm-hmm. Um, then it's very useful. I, I'm i more of the, like, I, I really believe like one of the, I'm kind of a Taoist so stoic. Mm. Um, and and I have found that the the mixing and matching of Taoism and Stoicism works just right for me, right? Yeah. Like go with the flow. Um, don't react. I think people are way too reactive. Like I I I only get worked up about something is if I think that I could by my actions make something different and better yeah. and i don't do that then i get worked up but as long as yeah. i do do it then like the like today on twitter like there's this whole thing about blue check marks right i saw your yes yeah fucking get it man i i was a legacy check mark i didn't apply for it i got it probably because of my son patrick to be honest yeah. the guy was like wow we might as well do the old man too at the same time 
<laughs> and so I didn't apply for it. I got it. They took it away. I bought the Twitter blue. I wanted to be able to edit my tweets and that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. But th- to see this hysteria around, like, and they're making this poor woman the character of the day. It on Twitter, like you, people will die because of this. Okay, right. You might have want to. Re- she should have Twitter blue so that she yeah. could edit that tweet. <laughs> right, 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 right. But like, I don't care if if you know if if I can't do anything about it. Like, my yeah. opinion is just as worthless as everyone else's, right? And and. I I just think that this reactive nature of you know general you know shrink wrapped human OS is to be very reactive, yeah. And Definitely. I I think that it's better to kind of like lean into Edith Piaf, the French singer, had a great thing where she says, "Man, if you want to be a star, the only way that's going to happen is you got to lean into your faults and your defects mm. because." Like that makes you different. That makes you unique, right? And, For sure. and with all, I'd be interested in all the kind of successful people that you write about and everything. Have you ever found somebody where they weren't persistent, where they weren't process oriented, where they weren't focused? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, No, no, I can't think of anyone. My so one of the things I often think about is Hassan Minaj, the comedian. Um, he was asked if he he thought he was going to become before he was a big time comedian. He he was asked if he thought he was going to become a big time comedian, and he said he didn't like that question because that question implies that he's doing what he's doing as a means to some end. And for him, he had already won because he got to do the thing he likes to do, which was comedy. Um, And that seems to be a common trait across domains and people that, um, like David Center, I think is a great example of someone who the work is the win. Like he just loves doing the thing that he does and getting to do it is, is the win for him. And the things that the external recognition, the people reaching out to him, the cool conversations he gets to have, um, the cool dinners he gets to go to are a nice cherry on top. But for him, the best part of it is sitting down in his room and recording a podcast. And that I think is the common trait that I see across um, the people I write about and read about and look up to. Um, so it's for them, it's not, it doesn't seem like they have to get themselves motivated to go do, to put in the persistent work. It's, it's the thing they just are, are compelled to do. I, I have found much the same. Um, I, I used to say like the worst thing that you ever hear is, oh, I want to do this because I want to get rich. I can count on my hands. I mean, that was that's my old business, right? I was an asset manager, and right. but my clients were all rich, and, right. and and when I would talk to them, like what I found, which really resonated with me, was like I would do what I do for nothing, right? I would do it just because I want to do it. Yeah, and maybe that's kind of selfish on my part, but like I found the same underlying characteristic in all these fabulously rich people whose money I was managing. It was never money ever. It was like, if it was Ralph Lauren, I'm not saying we managed money for him. I wouldn't name somebody if we did. Right. Right. You can infer that I didn't manage Ralph Lauren's money. Yes. But the, the but the fact is that he did what he wanted because he wanted beautiful clothes. He, he, he was obsessed by them. Right. And like, I talked to various people who we did manage money for and like every time it was always, no, 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 no. It, that was a out. That was a nice byproduct. I, I would have definitely been doing it, which leads to that whole process, right? Because you're just, you're going to keep doing it whether, yeah. whether it 
has this huge payoff or not. And yeah. yet it it kind of also allows you to build an algorithm for kind of success, which is David, he wouldn't put it that way, but it's kind of what he's looking for. He's kind of looking for the common characteristics that that make these people the way they are. And one of one of the yeah. things that you talk about, which I really like, is the this idea of conceptual ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. And because as you were saying, uh about the comedian, right? I my viewpoint is anyone who is alive today, right now, has won the cosmic fucking lottery. Yes. Because we are living at the safest time in the Earth's history. We are living at a time of the most innovation. We are living at like all of these things. And we are all the results of millions of years of unbroken progress. What what do I mean by that? Well, our ancestors procreated <laughs> and here yeah. we are right and for sure and so one of the things that i like about the way you approach things is where you talk about michelangelo was obsessed by anatomy but that in in uh uh affected the sistine chapel yeah nothing, nothing got siloed right and shakespeare's Prosper, prospero became tolkien's gandalf and i don't know if you're a fan of the show succession but like Logan Roy is basically King Lear meets Rupert Murdoch, right? Right. Do you find that that's the way you like things come together when you're writing about them? Yes, for sure. Um, I'm trying to remember. I'm I'm looking for this line. I recently uh, on this conceptual ancestors idea, um, Willa Cather. I, she was a, a, a writer, I believe, but she said that there are only two or three human stories and they go on repeating themselves as fiercely as if they had never happened before. Um, and I, I, I think that's so spot on. Like everyone is kind of, all, all of the great stories are a version of each other just with different characters and, um, and it's been a bit big. Uh, a big lesson in like reading biography is the the common through lines you see again and again. Um, but the the conceptual an ancestor thing, I also not not just in the the context of movies or books, or I also think about that kind of tied to the introduction introjection thing we we talked about earlier um, and finding people you admire and kind of becoming, letting them be your conceptual ancestors um, is, is a pretty good strategy for going about like the, what you should be doing, the kind of work you should be doing. Who do you admire and can you do your version of that? You know, as I, as I was preparing uh, and going over your stuff, uh, I, I, I came across that idea of yours. And, and so I do this two quotes, two thoughts from series every day. Yes. And, and so I thought, you know what, I'm going to go look and see what the first 10 people that I immediately put up as, as maybe, maybe a, using your idea of, um, of con conceptual ancestors, maybe the first 10 that I did are maybe in some way my conceptual ancestors. And so I found yeah. the list like really interesting. I'm going to give it to you. Yes. So number one, Voltaire. Number two, Marcus Aurelius. Number three, Nelson Mandela. Victor Frankl, Aristophanes, Bob Dylan, Picasso, Buckminster Fuller, Robert Benchley, and Isaac Newton. Those were my 10 <laughs> that, wow. I, that I quoted first. And and I never even thought about that until I read your conceptual ancestor piece. And I'm like, I wonder if there's anything there. That's super interesting. Yeah. Do you like if oh, I you're to, some of you're some of those people? And 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 so if I would ask you, if you off the top of your head, I'm putting you on the spot. Who who would who would be on your list if you were doing two two thoughts from a day? Who would be your first go tos? 
definitely Ryan and Robert, Robert Green. Um, I told you I recently read this Dr. Seuss biography, and I've just been obsessed with him recently, so he would be on there. Um, and then after that, I read about Jim Henson, the creator of Muppets. Mm-hmm. Um, he would he would be I love the way he uh, talked about his work and why he did what he did. Uh, so he would be on that list. Bob Dylan would probably he, he's my favorite musician. Uh, Bob Dylan and, and John Mayer are two of my musical heroes. Um, Marcus Aurelius would have to be on there. I spent a lot of time with Marcus. Um, who else? Uh, I'm looking, let me see. Um, I don't know who else I would put on there. I think I'll I'll go with those for now. Okay, I'll have to think about. It, but I'm I I, I, I I would wait. When you think of the other ones, would you put it up on Twitter so that so that I can uh, see your yeah. it out list? I would be really my, my ten conceptual ancestors. Yeah, yeah. Because I you know these might not actually be. I haven't really. I I just did this because I keep everything on Apple Notes because yeah. it's easy <laughs> and with, when i'm not writing it out actually by hand it's just really easy for me too and so i just keep the list as i go through people i'm like okay maybe i'll but these first 10 were like immediately who who am i going to go for i'm going to go to voltaire i'm going to go to marcus aurelius etc i would be really interested in your 10 okay because uh, i wonder do you think like do you think everything's a remix like I, yes. I wonder about that a lot. Yeah, you do. Yeah, I do. And, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in that idea. And and maybe distinctiveness emerges from you, your unique remix, right? Yes. Yes, I think so. Um, I think the the uh, the unique. So I was I was listening to um, Rick Rubin just started a podcast and he had um, this filmmaker on I, I'm forgetting the guy's name but Rick Rubin asked him is does one script could one script make one movie or could it make five hundred different movies and the guy said if you and I had the same exact script we would make two different movies and it's the same and if you Jim and I Billy had that same script, we would make different movies. So I think there's something about like, and if you and I read the same book, the things we would pull out of it would be different. Um, So we're working with the same raw material, but what we find interesting and what we want to pull out and add to our uh, remix, that's where your kind of unique perspective, I think, comes in and is what allows uh, what we what we think to be original work, um, like Jonathan Lethem, the, the novelist, said that if if you think something is original, you just don't know the sources. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, I I agree with that. Um, I think to be original is actually just to have the most obscure sources. That's a really interesting idea. It's it's along the lines of uh, I was chatting with a colleague earlier and. Um, it, we were talking about all of the source material that is now available that it's out of copyright it's in the it's in the history books and, yeah. and then like i did a deep dive on that once when i read um uh, dan brown's the da vinci code right yeah and i'm a kind of a history nut and and i'm like i'm reading this book and i'm like you know i think i read something about this and so I went on this, I jumped on that rabbit hole. It turns out like the entire thing is based on historical, actual occurrences. There really was a French arist- aristocratic family that yeah. that they were the descendants of Jesus Christ. Right. 
and, and I'm like, I'm reading it. I'm loving it. And so oh, I'm wow. starting to see it everywhere, like Men in Black. Yeah. Like, that comes from original interviews from the 1930s and 40s where they would interview people who had seen UFOs and all of them said different things about the aliens, but they all said, and yeah, a nondescript car pulled up and men in black suits came out. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and so it's like we were talking. So we have different verticals in O'Shaughnessy Ventures and one is infinite media. And my colleague that I was talking to is the lead on infinite media. And we're like, yeah, we can just, you know what? We can just like go to history and boom, you got 12 new uh, uh, ideas for a book or a movie or or whatnot. Um, yeah, 100%. And, and you know, you you had the your your coffee cup theory of AI, which I love. I, I know you or I don't know if you know, but I am I'm the chairman of Stability AI and an investor in that company. Um, oh, I didn't know that. And uh, but I love where you say uh, the artists that really resonate are when they pull taste and audience taste together in the center of a Venn diagram. Yeah. Like, is that, do you think there's a formula for that or is that just. I think it's, it's the perennial challenge that will never, never be solved. And whether it's made by a human or by a computer, there's no way. Um, so that Venn diagram is like the one circle is the artist taste and the other circle is um, the audience taste and the challenge is finding the, the overlap between those things and every a, a, everyone that's put out work into the world has had the experience of thinking this is the, the greatest thing I've ever made and no one likes it conversely you put something out that you think I, I think this is, is I think this is good but it probably it probably won't do great uh, when I publish it and and that thing goes crazy viral um and so taste is trying to hone in on better calculating what's going to work with the audience and what isn't i think um and it's really there i don't think there could ever be a formula or you could ever know for sure it's always at best an educated guess like uh matt damon talks about how um, he says they're all bets. He was asked, like, is there has there ever been a movie you, you worked on where you knew it was it was gonna be a box office hit? And he said, They're all bets. Um you can you can get a great team together, a great script, uh all all the ingredients, and for whatever reason the the audience doesn't like what you made. Um and I I agree, I agree with that. And from my experience of writing online and um and working on on books with ryan and others it's it's really hard to know for sure what's going to work um, and i think it's that's kind of the best the best part about creating is um is getting that feedback from the audience and learning what what resonates with others And do you think sometimes that, like, I think that, that that's always been part of my thesis about why markets work so well, mm -hmm. because essentially that's what prices are, right? Prices are feedback. And, right. And like, you, you, you might not like that feedback. <laughs> right. And, and, and you might rally against that feedback. <laughs> yeah. But that's what they are, and that's why unfettered, for the most part, markets work. And you know, the more you try to regulatory capture them, the more you skew them against the actual best optimized outcome, right? Um, and yet, like perfection is 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 a myth. There is no such thing as perfection. I had a great new writer, Edward Rooster, on. Uh, and he had this great line, perfection is a 100% tax. And I love that because huh. like you can't, you, 
perfection is something you strive for but never reach. And like it, it seems simple to me that you should understand that like perfection is unobtainable. It's unobtainium. Right. Yeah. And and that doesn't mean that you can't strive to do great things, but right. like you're never it's never going to be perfect. We're all flawed to some degree. I, I'm a big fan of Jed McKinna, the fic yeah. the fictional character who it tells us why we're all fictional characters. And <laughs> like one one of the things that he is forever going on about is th this idea that like you're you're only fooling yourself if you think like that you know right yeah it, you, like searching for certainty is just like a fool's errand because there there is no such thing right and he's got this great thing where where he says um uh crazy is a numbers game and then his conversant says what do you mean and he goes and then the conversant says you mean the more people believe it and he goes then it ain't crazy yeah right <laughs> yeah so yeah. like well i also think about um like seth godin has written about taste and he uses the example of um like if you wear a if you wear a tuxedo to a black tie wedding you had good taste but if you wear a tuxedo to um you know some casual to the beach you had bad taste so it's and, and this the idea of perfection is like by who's who is the art like like i often think if when when people t post on twitter about how ai made this great image um i think like great it like by whose opinion um like who's judging it um and and i would add did ai make it or did the person working right with ai make it who prompted it to to do what it made that that is the art exactly i yeah completely agree right it's the human operating a listen ai is a tool that's what it is it's a yeah. great fucking tool and a very powerful tool but it is a tool. We human beings are tool makers. We always have been. Steel, there is no steel in nature. Steel came out of the minds of a human. Yeah. Right, and, right, right. And, and like everything surrounding us right now came out of our minds. Right? Cumulative cultural evolution. Yay. Because everything that, we, that defines the world around us right now came out of basically the human mind. Yes. Have have you seen the the Steve Jobs thing about the bicycle of the mind? Yes. Oh, I think that's that's when I I first came across that uh, a few months ago, and I thought this is the greatest analogy for for AI that I've I've come across. Completely um, agree. It is it is a very powerful tool, but it's yeah. a tool, and it's it's like fire. I, I love the George Carlin thing uh, where he says, I'm often really curious about the person who came up with the flamethrower. <laughs> yeah. That's because he's, he says that person is like thinking, you know, I'd really like to burn those people over there to death, but I'm not close enough to them. <laughs> right, right. But the point is, right, fire is incredibly useful. Yeah. But can also be used to burn villages down and burn people. So we didn't say, no, yeah. we can't have fire. We invented fire departments, fire alarms, fire extinguisher, fire exits, right? Right, right, right. We're gonna do the same thing with AI. Yes. It's not, it's not, it's it's like the tech itself is neutral. It's the one utilizing that tech who's gonna use it for good or ill, in my opinion. For sure. Yeah. I, I was back to I, humans. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've been reading a little bit about Henry Ford and like the pushback when he was trying to build automobiles. And 
I realized like the, the reason it was so hard for people then to conceive what automobiles would become is because when he was working on them, there weren't things like roads or stop signs or uh, traffic lights. So I, I often like when a new technology comes on, like what, what's going to be the roads and the traffic sign equivalent in this case? Like what, what is a, what is going to be, uh, invented or the innovations created sort of tangential to AI that, that make it, um, make more sense to us. I love that reference because you're absolutely right. It's like when, when, when the people came up with movie cameras, what did they think of? They thought, well, let's film a play because that was their right. own point of reference. Right. Right, 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 right. And, yeah. and, and like when radio, um, Edison was basically, well, I guess we could listen to sermons over radio. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 I, I was reading something recently that when, uh, I think it was in an Edwin Lamb biography, one of David Senra's, uh, favorite guys, uh, when he was developing the, uh, Polaroid camera, there was worry that it was going to replace painters, that the photography was going to replace painting. And I, and I thought, well, maybe like AI art will just be, there will be AI writing and human writing in the way that like there's painting and photography. Exactly. A new, a new, uh, genre of art. Yeah. It's, it's, it's additive. It is not, it does not replace. And, mm. I, and I think that the, uh, the thing wasn't land with Polaroid, but when they invented the first camera, it was all of the portrait artists were like oh, okay. bereft. Like, Oh my God, my whole living is done. And then, you know, uh, you, you see guys like Francis Bacon selling portraits for 10 million pounds. Right. And you think, yeah, I think, he, I think they can coexist nicely together. Yes. Yeah. So what, what like, what, what about where you're at right now? Like, what do you love? What do you like? Me, I'm not so much on loving this. Like, what would you change about what you're doing right now? Would you, what would you do more of? What would you do less of? Um, I'm actually, I'm in a pretty good spot and I'm doing mostly the things I want to be doing. So I had a conversation with Ryan, like middle of last year about, um, some things I was not wanting to, I, I, at the time I was managing the content calendar for, um, for daily stoic and daily dad and his personal site. Um, and we use ConvertKit to send out the daily email. And I was so, I had so much anxiety about logging into ConvertKit because it, I was a click away. It always felt like from sending out an email to hundreds of thousands of people. And I was just, and I couldn't escape that because it, because we send it out every day. Like when, once today's went out, now I'm worried about tomorrow's email. Um, so I, I was telling him about that and he was like, that's just a ridiculous thing for you to be stressed about. So we, we hired someone, um, who took over the content calendar and scheduling things and convert it and those, those sorts of things. And that's freed me up to do basically just the, the research and writing stuff. And it's, it's what it allowed me to become more active with my own stuff and doing the Twitter and, um, all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I feel like I'm in a good spot with, with workload and what I'm working on. Um, and most of my day is just reading and researching. Um, so I, that was my goal was to, to move away from, uh, the convert kit kind of s scheduling things. And, um, we're just kind of in a spot where she, the, the, the woman we hired, she's kind of fully now independent and has her her head wrapped around everything and um i feel pretty good about where i'm at very cool um 
Yeah, I I think that uh, it's very wise to um, understand that we're not good at everything and that yeah. uh, like find your pain points and guess what? Uh, one man's meat is another man's poison, right? And right. like I like if I tried to schedule my own things, like <laughs> it would be mayhem. Yeah. Literally it would be mayhem because I'm I'm a chaotic attractor in that regard. Yeah. But thank God I have somebody who's much better than me uh at that. Although not on this particular time because you didn't get your link. I'm yes. have words with her. Um this has been a lot of fun. Um at at the end of uh my podcast, as you might know, I always say we're gonna make you the emperor of the world for a day. You can't kill anybody. And you can't put them in re-education camps, but we are going to hand you a magical microphone and you're going to be able to incept all 8 billion people on the planet. Whenever they wake up their next morning, they're going to wake up and they're going to think that they thought of two things that they're going to act on, but they're going to actually be inceptions from you, Billy. What are you going to speak into the magic microphone and incept the world's population on? Um, to read more, to, 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 uh, yeah, I think to just, just, and to find like the, the love of, of reading and the pursuit of interesting ideas. Um, on the second for so I'm thinking about David Senra and what we were talking about as someone who has found the thing they were so clearly meant to do. And I often think about that kind of like alignment between the person and the work they're meant to do. Uh, so maybe I would put everyone on that search to find, to, to pursue and find that thing for them. Um, I love, I, I, I love what I love when I listen to, to David is, it's so clear that um he's found it and like we were saying about the people that are persistent in their work um i don't think it's willpower or discipline i think it's just a pure uh love for what they're doing and it's that like alignment um so so finding that would be my second uh command I love it. It's like Robert Frost, one of my favorite poets. He, he said, my aim in life is to unite my vocation and avocation as my two eyes make one in sight. Yes. Yeah. Like that. that That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. That he, said it, he said it a little better. Is amazing. That's well, so listen, good. Man, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for coming on. Thank uh, you for having me, Jim. This was, and, this was awesome. And uh, people can find you uh, uh, all over Twitter, your, your newsletters, um, you every you you want to yeah. give the other URLs for where where people might want to look. No, that's probably the best two places: Twitter and uh, the newsletter. Perfecto. All right. Well, thank you, awesome. my friend. Thank you, Jim.